Hello, I hope all is going well for you. The purpose of this video today is just to introduce you to the Statistical Consulting and Research Center and what we do. Uh, we're going to give you a little bit of information about our internal structure and how to get in touch with us as well. So just a brief introduction, the director of our program is Randy Cope. He will be the director through the summer of 2020 and starting fall of 2020, we will have a new director income. There are also two statistical assistants uh, at the center. Both of these are full-time 20 hour a week graduate assistants. The carryover assistant will be Sarah Crochelle. She'll be the senior assistant. Um, and a new graduate assistant will be hired at the beginning of the fall semester 2020. Um, additionally, our office location is in the ISELF building on St. Cloud State in room 228. Additionally, you can see our contact information here. You can see our email is statspss at St. Cloud State EDU, as well as both of our phone numbers. It is more likely that you'll get in touch with someone sooner if you use the STATS office phone number, but that email is probably the best option. Or you could stop in. Coverage is typically 8 a.m. to 4 p.m., but you can check at the office doors for more exact hours. Um, the services that we provide are free for all SCSU students and faculty, and some of the things we do is review your surveys before using them in research, assisting creating online surveys um, through Qualtrics, as well as data entry for paper surveys, and the majority of our jobs, which we be running analyses through SPSS, Minitab, and SAS. Assistance with statistical analyses and subsequently how you want to word those in your research, we can definitely help with as well. So picking up from where we left off, uh, in this video we're going to cover some basic statistics and the best practices associated with those in, in order for you to optimize your statistics in your research. Uh, the first thing that we're going to discuss is hypotheses. Um, up there, the first one you see is the null hypothesis. This hypothesis states that there's going to be no significant difference between populations, often represented by that HO up there. This is essentially you're expecting nothing to happen due to sampling or, ex or experimental error. The alternative hypothesis is your hypothesis that you're actually assuming something will happen. Um, this is a hypothesis that you want to prove. And observation would be caused by some, would be influenced by some kind of variable, not a random cause. Now we're going to go into the six steps to defining of making successful surveys. The first one would be to define your survey's objectives. This is key in understanding exactly what you want to know. You want to list the questions your survey should answer and focus on the big picture and keep your objectives narrowly scoped. More complex surveys results in less meaningful results because people suffer from fatigue or other influencing factors. Next up is to identify your target audience. So you want to de determine who exactly is going to be taking your survey. Uh, and you want to consider as many possible markets because you want to really maximize the amount of people that will be taking your survey. Uh, this will give you more generalizable and reliable results. Um, third, you want to prioritize your questions. You want to create questions related to your goals and objectives that you created in step one. And you also want to really think about adding in things, adding in parts to questions such as I don't knows or doesn't apply to me because you want to really be able to capture all the variants that you can and have people answer as accurately as possible, even if you're only giving them a limited number of choices. Uh, fourth, we want to test the survey. This might sound a little bit obvious at first, but you want to get as many eyes on your survey before it goes out as possible, looking for potential mistakes or just opportunities to improve it. Um, fifth, we're going to learn how to, you want to communicate your survey's purpose. So you really want to explain to your population what's in it for them whether it be a job satisfaction survey that will help organizations determine where exactly employees are unsatisfied or where things might not be in their job description to really hash out those details and give a clear communicated message that will ultimately increase the happiness of the organization. And finally, you want to analyze and act upon the results. Once it's in your database, you can slice this data however you want and really compare the results of your survey to the research that you conducted at the beginning and come up with specific and actionable responses to those objectives that you created in step one. Next, we're gonna go into different types of survey questions. The first one being multiple choice. This one, you can give several different questions to either mask what the actual answer is, or if you want to come up with time periods or dates for an event, multiple choice questions are probably what you want. Next up, we have fill in the blank. This consists of a phrase, sentence, or paragraph with a blank space for 
students to provide missing words. Typically, we want to use a finite range with these. Age is a great example of a fill in the blank question. Um, and then we can also use these fill in the blank questions to transform and code different people into different groups. Uh, categories with ranges. These range questions are similar to multiple choice questions. These can be used to group various demographics, in, uh, for example, income. Uh, you can put people into low, medium, and high levels of this and get the most from your data because of this. Open-ended questions, open up a conversation with the question. This really allows the applicant or the participant to be as descriptive as possible. This is where you want to, where you're really kind of fishing for information and you're allowing the participant to talk about potential things that you might want to bring up as maybe future areas of research. Finally, we have the check all that apply question. And this is a structured question format in which respondents are presented with a list of terms and asked to select those that apply to a sample. Um, and there's two different ways that you can kind of get results from these types of questions. You can add up the total checks to make them fill up certain concepts, or you can look at what percent of people checked each possible answer. So you can either look at the total or each individual response. Uh, next, we're gonna go into some types of analyses. These are descriptive analyses. Um, some of them I'm sure you're pretty familiar with. Mean is the average of the set. Median is the middlemost number. Mode is the most common number. Frequencies are just the numbers of the number of times that a data value occurs. Standard deviation is a measure of how close numbers are to the mean, and standard error is the standard deviation of its sampling distribution or an estimate of that standard deviation. Uh, one last note to, to make in these types of analyses is this difference between categorical and continuous data. So categorical data is data that fits directly into categories. It's not necessarily an infinite range of numbers. So a good example of categorical data might be uh, gendered, for example. There are a few select categories that you can kind of go into, whereas continuous is going to be a set number, a range, a large range. So age could be an example of a continuous variable because you can answer at any point along the scale. However, you can even put continuous data into categorical data by grouping, say, 18 to 25 as young people and 25 to 35 as just a shy of middle age. Also a point of note for categorical data, it is often used in cross tabs. Uh, we'll get into that later. Another example of categorical data usage would be in cross tabs. We'll be looking at an example later that looks at attending review sessions, yes or no, or what grade you got in the class, A, B, C, D, or F. Now going on from that, we can see a normally distributed graph here. This is a bell curve graph. It's, in, it's very symmetrical, as you can see. And down on the bottom here, we have, uh, this symbolizes one standard deviation. Um, within one standard deviation, we see that we can withhold 68% uh, of the population. That's how much fits in one standard deviation of a normally distributed bell curve. 95% would be within the first two standard deviations and within three standard deviations. We, we get all the way up to 99%. And typically to get this kind of distribution, you wanna have a sample size of over 70. That's what research kind of points to. So that's what we request from a lot of our potential grad students and faculty members when they come to us asking about how big their sample size should be. Next up, we've got some comparative and inferential analyses. The first one that I'll talk about is t-test. There's two different kinds of these. You have the paired sample t-test, which really looks at kind of like a pre-test versus post-test. So it would be 30 participants who were examined at two different times. So just 30 individuals, two different test results for each individual. Independent samples t-test are related to having like a control group and an experimental group. So you'd have 60 total people for the same amount of data, data points as the 30 that do the paired sample. Next up is we have correlation. And this is a technique that can show whether and how strongly pairs of variables are related. For example, height and weight are related. Taller people tend to be heavier than shorter people. That's a correlation. Uh, next up, we're going to look at uh, ANOVA, which is an analysis of variance, and this is used in designs that involve more than two groups, two or more groups, I should say. And this will tell whether values significantly differ between the groups. However, it doesn't tell you which groups differ from which groups, just that they differ from each other. 
to be able to find out that information, you need to run post hoc tests on the ANOVA to determine which groups differ from which groups. Finally, we have regression, and this is used to estimate the relationship between a continuous TV and one or more continuous independent variables. And ultimately, this is used to create a predictive model of the dependent variable based on the independent variable. We're going to go into these analyses a little bit further. The first one that we're kind of going to cover is the Pearson correlation. It's often represented by that small r up there, and this describes the relationship between two variables. This statistic is bound between negative one and one, meaning it's not going to exceed either of those numbers. The closer the number is to either one or negative one, the stronger the relationship between the two variables, meaning close to zero has the least amount of relationship, none actually. Positive relationships move in the same direction. So if we're closer to one, then both our variables increase at the same time. So that's that height and weight kind of relationship while negative relationships move in opposite directions. So as one increases, the other has a tendency to decrease. And then at the bottom here, we can kind of see the breakdown of correlations of 0 to 0.3 generally considered as no relationship. 0.3 to 0.5 is a low relationship. 0.5 and above is kind of generally the point of having uh, a moderate relationship between two variables, and above 0.7 is considered a very strong relationship. Next up, we're going to look at a correlation output. So this is what SPSS actually shows us, our statistical program, when you look at the correlation between two different things. Um, so here you can see that we have a significant correlation because this alpha level is below 0.05, and that's something we're going to get into a little bit later. And also you can see we're above 0.7 between jumping distance and height. So if you're taller, have longer legs, you can jump further. Makes sense. However, it might be a little bit more confusing if you were to have a low correlation here, but still have it be very strongly significant. A good example of this is blood pressure and age. The older you get, the higher your blood pressure tends to be. However, they have a low correlation, though it is statistically significant. The reason that the correlation is still low is because blood pressure is also influenced by a large variety of other variables. For example, how much you eat, how healthy you eat, how much exercise you do. So there is a relationship, and you can say that it statistically is significant. However, you can see if it's low, there are probably confounding factors influencing that relationship. So now I'm going to be discussing cross tabs and chi-square. So more so, I'm going to discuss when we're going to use those. Cross tabs are generally used to examine relationships within data that may not be readily apparent. Cross tabulation is especially useful for studying market research or survey responses. And we'll have a good example of that coming up soon. Market researchers use the chi-square test when they find themselves in one of the following situations. They need to estimate how closely an observed distribution matches an, ex an expected distribution, and this is referred to as a goodness of fit test. And they also would use it when they need to estimate whether two random variables are independent of one another. So now here's this example of cross tabs. In this particular setting, we're looking at whether or not attending review sessions impacts what kind of grade you would get in a class. So cross tabs shows our frequencies of our count and our expected count for each level of our two variables. Um, additionally, in SPSS, we can get these numbers in percentages as well as the totals in percentages. Uh, one thing that I should mention is that there is an assumption that you have to meet when conducting cross tabs that you want five count in each of your cell blocks in each of these quadrants. If you don't meet this assumption, your results could potentially be skewed. And so to correct for this, we would combine several of the small ones together. So for example, this D and F column, these, these two rows, we would probably combine into just a low grade uh, level so that we could have, we could meet this assumption of having enough counts in each of our blocks. Up next, we have this one-way ANOVA output. Here we can see we also have this significance level again, this time it being um, below 0.05, meaning that this is a statistically significant relationship. It's also important to note that when adding multiple variables into this analysis, the most significant independent variable is added into the predictive model at each step of the model. This continues until all significant independent variables have been added. In this way, the predictive model is defined in steps. So coming back to the significance level, most experts, most statisticians, put the 
significance level of their alpha at 0.05 when conducting research. This isn't always the case, uh, kind of depending on the content or context of your research. Some people will set it lower or higher depending on how stringent you want to be. But essentially, putting it at, at this 0.05 level gives you a 95% confidence in your results. That's uh, reminiscent of another statistic that we use, which is the confidence interval. And this is a range of likely values for population parameter, um, such as the population mean. So an example of this, if you were to compute a 95% confidence interval for the average price of a terrier, then you can be 95% confident, confident that that interval contains the true average cost of all terriers. Uh, so next we're gonna look at when do you use regression. Regression analysis is used when you wanna predict a continuous dependent variable from a number of independent variables. Uh, a very good example of this would be, um, are drinking coffee and smoking cigarettes related to mortality risk? So our independent variables in this would be drinking coffee and smoking cigarettes. You would use those to predict your dependent variable, which is mortality risk. So you're looking at those two variables to kind of determine what this end outcome results in. Up here, I'm not gonna go into each kind of possible regression that you can run, but I'm just gonna briefly describe the three main ideologies that these regressions fit into. So the first one is a simple regression. This uses one independent variable in the equation to predict the dependent variable. Uh, multiple regression forces all predictors into an equation to build the best representation of the relationship between the dependent variable and the independent variables in the equation. And finally, we have stepwise. So this builds a step-by-step -step regression model to predict the dependent variable by examining the set of independent variables and using the most significant variable at each step of the regression. And this continues until all significant independent variables have been added. I hope you learned a little bit more about basic statistical procedures like how to create a successful survey or perhaps learned a little bit more about descriptive statistics, correlations, and regression. I hope you feel more comfortable using Minitab or SPSS running these kinds of statistics or just asking questions about them to us. Finally, don't be afraid to contact us early in your process. Too early is not impossible. We'd love to help you get your survey set up and sent out. Um, and again, I have our office information located up here again if you want to get in touch with us. Thank you very much for your time and have a nice day.